Welcome to the EpicureanFriends.com book review of A Few Days in Athens, a story about Epicurus and Epicurean philosophy. Please keep in mind that A Few Days in Athens is fictional, and the author is giving you her own interpretation of Epicurus. In a few cases, she deviates from Epicurus's own views fairly dramatically, but when we get to those, we'll point them out to you clearly. Even more, keep in mind that the participants you're about to hear are giving their own opinions. There are many different interpretations of Epicurus, and we hope this book review will prompt you to study Epicurus for yourself. For those who want to read more about Epicurus, the book we recommend the most is Norman DeWitt's Epicurus and His Philosophy. We also invite you to join us for discussion at the EpicureanFriends.com forum and to listen to our companion podcast, Lucretius Today, which is available at all major podcast sources. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll enjoy this session, so let's join it now. Okay, we finished talking about Chapter 3 last week, and now we're going to be working on Chapter 4, which is basically a one-scene episode, if I remember correct, where the students of Epicurus escort into his presence a visitor who is Gryphon the Cynic. I did a quick Google a moment ago to see if Gryphon was a real name of a real cynic, and I couldn't find anything. Does anybody know any different there? I've never, I didn't know the name either. The Wikipedia section on cynicism says that basically the, for cynics, the purpose of life is to live in virtue and agreement with nature. As reasoning creatures, people can gain happiness by rigorous training and by living in a way which is natural for themselves, which sounds conventional stoicism to me there. But rejecting all conventional desires for wealth, power, and fame, and even flouting conventions openly and derisively in public. And instead, they lead, they were to lead a simple life free from all possessions. In my layman's interpretation of the cynics, I guess that's what I've always associated with them is the flouting of conventions in public, which we don't necessarily need to get too graphic about tonight. <laughs> but I gather it was, a, was fairly aggressive in different ways, living like a dog or something or somewhere. Yeah. You know, what I've turned, what I found out to be fairly successful when we have the pleasure of Joshua here is, let me just say a few things about the events of the chapter. And Joshua has been really good at being able to explain some of the major pieces of it. Am I going to be correct about that again tonight, Joshua? Are you kind of ready to tell some stories? Oh, I don't know if I'll be able to come up with much, but uh, (laughs) certainly I'll do my best. Okay, very good. I've created this first slide, which just sets up the major events of the chapter, which is, like I said, they introduce Gryphus to Epicurus, and then they have a banter back and forth, because apparently Gryphus' intent on his visit is to tell Epicurus that he should do everybody a favor and stop teaching in Athens. And they have a pretty witty exchange back and forth, which the book goes into in some detail, and we can decide how much of that we want to repeat here tonight. But they have a witty response. I I even made a comment of one. Epicurus says that even if he were to restrict himself to teaching other fools, his gardens could not hold all the fools of Athens. And so they go back and forth with that kind of a a thing. And then after Gryphon is, I don't know that there's really that much philosophically in Gryphon's presentation other than what Epicurus is then going to observe when he's gone. So the majority of the lessons, I think, of this chapter are going to be, once he does leave, Epicurus goes into a discussion with his students about how the manifestations of Gryphon's appearance have stemmed from his pride, vanity, and ambition. And then there's some very interesting statements that Epicurus makes about the nature of ambition And I think the most interesting parts of this chapter are probably those sections where he's discussing with Leontium and the others that ambition can be a very bad thing in certain circumstances, but it can occasionally or sometimes be a very good thing or something that needs to be pursued by people who have the ambition and the ability to go along with. And then there's the last comment I made here was something to the effect that of course, I can't help but think of what is a Clint Eastwood, right? How a man is going to know his limitations. Is that where that comes from in the modern movie section? A man needs to know his limitations. Joshua, is that a Clint Eastwood movie? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, 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 have to, I'll have to follow up. I can give you a reference from uh, Batman Begins, but I don't know if that's going to be <laughs> as helpful as, as Clint Eastwood. I'm afraid this is... It does isn't... sound like, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly or something. Yeah, is that, is, I'm thinking <laughs> something about that. Yeah, yeah. This is the burden of being the oldest person. But Scott, you should be helping me with that. Do you not remember that? No, I mean, it sounds familiar, but yeah, yeah. I couldn't think about it. I'm not good at that kind of reference. I don't win a trivia. 
<laughs> yeah, no, neither do I, neither do I. So I skipped over to the second slide here because I have five different paragraphs cited here. He talks about pride in this first one, and then the desire for distinction, how it can produce unhappiness, especially in the wrong person. And then he talks about somebody who's got the seeds of greatness in them. And this may even reflect back to the issue of the painting that we, we discussed fairly at length from chapter three. But Leontium points out that Epicurus will make a distinction between what's beyond the reach of our capacity and what's beyond the reach of our practice. And then the last one is something about heroes and the ambitious, which I was talking about earlier. So, Joshua, do you have thoughts before we go into some of these passages? Well, certainly there's quite a lot of material on on cynicism that we could go into. Um, what else? What is, else should we cover about it that I did not? Well, and I mean, in the realm of stories, it's hard to beat uh, Diogenes because he's got a lot of them. So that would be one option. Like I said, I didn't put together an outline. So, I'm... well, I tell you what. Given that, to some extent, our audience is not just our group tonight, but also people who might listen in the future. What do you think stands out or some examples of the, which I will characterize as the ridiculousness of Diogenes the Cynic, uh, other than just living in a ceramic uh, tub or something like that? I think there's famous pictures or etchings of all over the place with, with Diogenes living in a tub. So yeah, the, cha yeah, the challenge would be to come up with some interesting ones, Joshua, that still keep the episode G rated for the family uh, tonight. <laughs> well, there, there's quite a lot of those as well. I know that Don, although he's not here with us, there's a story that he particularly likes where uh, I think Aristotle, was it, gives this definition of man as being a featherless bipod. And then yeah. Diogenes walks in with a plucked chicken and said, behold, Aristotle's man or however that went. Maybe it was Plato's <laughs> man. That's one story you've got. That's kind of the good side of the cynics there, probably. Well, it's a mixed bag. Some of, yeah. some of what they had to say was was, I think, quite interesting. Um, some of it was probably somewhat repulsive. So, so there's different sides here. Um, but he would, he would walk through the streets of, of Athens with a lamp, you know, like a lighted lantern. And when people asked what he was looking for, he would say an honest man. <laughs> so there's an element of that in there. One of my favorite stories has to do with the issue of death in particular. And, and I think that's an issue where you might find a little bit of a, agreement between cynicism and Epicureanism, although I have not looked into this with any depth. Uh, but the story goes something like this. Diogenes was asked by his townspeople how they should dispose of his body uh, after he dies. And he said, oh, just, just throw it over the city walls. There's no need to go to any trouble. And they said, well, yeah, but what about the wild dogs? Aren't you afraid that, you know, the animals are going to, you know, defile your body? And Diogenes said, well, no, of course not, because you're going to throw down a stick right next to me so that I can defend myself from wild animals. And the townspeople replied, well, if you're dead, how are you going to use a stick to defend those wild animals? And Diogenes said, if I'm dead, why do I care what they do to my body? It would be very Epicurean now. Huh? Yeah, yeah. One thing that really strikes me, though, there, God, there's, there's so many of those stories. One thing that strikes me as I look at this passage, I think it, in the last week, this issue of the painting and the arts in general and maybe music came up and the question was why did francis wright spend so long talking about a painting i'm not saying this is the right answer but the answer i proposed to that question was something to the effect of what she's doing here is, is establishing a contrast between the day-to-day -day life how she imagines it to be in the garden of epicurus as opposed to what we're going to come to in a few chapters on the day-to-day -day life on the portico and I think as I read this chapter, I get kind of a similar sense. In fact, the word contrast is in the first paragraph of this chapter. So this, I think, has relevance for us because one of the issues that we deal with, one of the misinterpretations as we see it of Epicurean philosophy is the idea that it's an ascetic philosophy, that, you know, to be an Epicurean, you're going to withdraw from the world, withdraw from politics. All you need is bread and water, and you're going to go live in a cave. And in this chapter, I think she sets up a direct contrast with people who do really live on bread and water and who do, you know, wear rags for clothing and who do live in a, in a tub in the streets, if not a cave. So I think that that contrast is an element of what's going on here with this uh, section on cynicism. 
Joshua, it certainly makes sense to me. And, you know, I don't know whether you've at this. Did you say that at this point you finished reading the whole book or are you still reading it uh, piece by piece? Uh, I've read the whole thing at least okay. once, maybe, maybe twice. Okay. Well, certainly we are going to be having that contrast with the Stoics that you were talking about. I also recall that at least there's at least one more when the, because there's a fairly extensive discussion of Pythagoreans later yes. on. I think that Hedone, one of the characters, has come from their school and give sort of a report at some point. So there's at least the Stoics, the Cynics, and Pythagoreans. I can't remember if there's others that might be Aristotle and Plato or not. Yeah, I, I definitely, you're onto something by this, by the contrast that's sort of throughout. I mean, clearly that's what she's doing with pulling different scenes from uh, other schools in, in Greek philosophy in several of these chapters. And then the sort of teachable moment that we get is, you know, just because Griffiths dresses in rags and sort of wears himself in a manner that would not be generally considered appropriate by polite society. The defects of character that he suffers from that led him down that path, Epicurus uses that to say, like, but even we, you know, even we might go down that path. And it's not necessarily by wearing rags or by having a rent in your garment or by sleeping in a tub, but there are other ways to experience the same kinds of problems expressed very differently. Yeah, that's the paragraph I have up now on the screen that we're sharing. The first one, might as well take, take a second. Pride need not always lead a man to cut Mount Ethos in two like Xerxes, nor ambition to conquer a world and weep that there's not another one yet to conquer like Alexander, nor vanity to look in a stream at his own face till he fall in love with it like Narcissus. When we cannot cut an ethos, we can leave uncut our beast. When we cannot mount a throne, we may crawl into a tub. And when we have no beauty, we may increase our ugliness. If a man of even small or moderate talents be smitten with a great desire of distinction, there's nothing too absurd, perhaps nothing too mischievous for him to commit. Our friend the cynic, happily for himself and his neighbors, seems disposed to rest with the absurd. Aristotus took the mischievous to eternize his name, destroying that temple by the building of which Atesiphon immortalized his. Be it our care to be equally clear of the one as the other. I, I, that's a, another bit of excellent Francis Wright to, to, to warn against the extremes that the attitude can take. Right, and I think that reinforces kind of my idea about what she's been doing all along in the you know the, the issue with the painting. and it's, it's all about setting up a contrast because just saying what Epicureanism stands for it doesn't necessarily really do the job of presenting a picture in people's minds. But if you have something to compare it to, as she does, I think you get to a much better idea of what's going on. Now, Joshua, I'm thinking that when I look at the next paragraphs that I've cited as being particularly important, it's almost to me like she's used the the cynic robe and the way he's dressed and so forth to set up that first one. But I'm thinking that the next several paragraphs or the next several points are more general and maybe even not specifically directed at the cynics because like the first one I've cited next is the issue of the desire for distinction is uh, dangerous in the head of a fool, unhappy in a man of moderate abilities, but especially in a man who can conceive a noble aim, but lacks the talent or the means necessary for its attainment. It's fortunate only in the head of a genius, the heart of a sage, and in a situation convenient for its development and gratification. These three things you will allow do not often meet in one person. Now, they may actually meet sometimes, though. I would presume that we would consider Epicurus to be an example of somebody who was fortunate in those areas, was so situated that he could express and live up to his potential. I don't know that that really applies to the cynics in particular, but it's it's a very interesting point. Right. Take and anything I, from that. Well, I particularly find interesting um, the part she says about convenient circumstances. Mm -hmm. and the necessity of convenient circumstances to really bring these things in flower. And I, I don't know how helpful this will be, but the connection I make, I think it was Matthew Arnold um, who has this long book called Culture and Anarchy, um, but there's a section in it called Hellenism and Hebrewism, and I hope I'm citing the right author and the right source. But one of the interesting comments that was made, again, I think in that book, 
was that there are certain ages that are more disposed to poetic expression, right? So you you don't find um, you know poetry is not is not an art that turns people's heads uh, in in the early part of the year 2022. But there are times in history, moments in history, where there seems to be this cultural predisposition, this receptivity to that kind of thing, um, where you you know you can in effect make a living solely on the back of your poems. Horace, for example, who was a Latin poet and uh, a kind of an Epicurean, um, although he has some problems with that as well, uh, he, he turned to poetry only after everything else in his life had failed um, and and got his success that way. But that is not a route to success, uh, as I said, in the year 2022. So I, I it's do, amazing. I, it's amazing what you can do on TikTok and things like that, though. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think, I think she's onto something there with, with this idea that convenient circumstances or however she phrased that it may be a necessary ingredient for the blossoming of whatever you want to call it, ambition or genius or whatever word she uses. But, uh, I do think that there are times and places, um, like the Renaissance, for example, was a big time and a big place in which, uh, there was a, a flowering, a, a pouring forth of uh, humans and art, poetry and painting and music and statue and statecraft and uh, navigation. You know, it's like everything just exploded. Joshua, also the, the direct reference and dodge in these lyrics that we have talked about before, and I think this is a good explanation, is where it talks about that the, the man can't become wise in every, I think it says constitution and nation or something like that. To me, this is an explanation of what that probably means, is that you have to have fortunate circumstances to even survive, much less become uh, wise and develop your abilities. And, you know, in addition to that, I'll make this comment that I think there's also a reference on the inscription of Diogenes of Oinoander, which says something similar, because I believe it's early in the, in the inscription, but there's a, a, a reference to something about the those who are well disposed towards us or something like that. Maybe it's in that section you're talking about in terms of strangers and so forth, you know, happy to those who are all disposed. But there, there does seem to have been a thread here of it's probably just it, it's, it's not a something they're happy about, probably, but it's a, probably just a recognition of reality that not everybody lives in fortunate enough circumstances to develop their capacities. And that's just a fact of nature, a fact of life. I think so. And, and for me, I want to say that that says something very important. I don't know. Maybe it's not that important, but. I always keep hearing from Epicureanism, from Epicurus and so forth, and I and I presume that in this case Wright is representing him well, but he is imminently practical. He's very pragmatic. He's not going to let some ideal get so damn lofty that say, you know, it's like the successories posters, you know, it's like if you have teamwork, you can defeat anything or whatever. You know, here we have this idea of distinction, and you could be, you know, really super smart and all this other stuff, and it's still not going to work out for you. This is really honest look at human reality. And that comes through again and again. And this is not the only time I've run into this. I keep seeing this with, with Epicurus, that, that he's so pragmatic that he's willing to say this is the case that, you know, even if you really are great, you're maybe not going to be great here because, you know, you just don't have everything's not lining up for you or something. And I just want to say that I have that feeling from this, this little section too, that there's, there's Epicurus and his pragmatism again. And I oppose pragmatism here to the idea of, you know, idealism. They're not exactly antithesis of each other, but they're they're in different, you know, areas, sort of. Scott, I think about that, too, in this context, in the sense that, you know, Epicurus concludes that pleasure is the end of life. And so, therefore, you're going to do everything, at least in this, uh, you know, the ways we've discussed it, at least in an abstract, where everything leads to the sum of pleasure or happy living or whatever. But I almost get the impression that, you know, he, he's reached that conclusion and he's going to stick with it. But it's like when from a the point when he was a child and he was con confronting this issue of chaos, I don't think he sees the two as competitive. He wants the truth. He wants reality. And, yeah. and, and he's concluded that the reality is, is that the goal of life is pleasure. But on the other hand, he, could, he certainly sees that some people don't, don't succeed, they could die young, whatever. They, it's not something mm -hmm. that universally is promised to everybody. So I do think that that's one of the major aspects, which is one of the reasons why I reject so strongly the issue of, well, he had his position about the gods because he wanted to protect himself so that he didn't meet the, the fate of Socrates. I understand that's a, a logical argument and so forth, but 
Epicurus impresses me as the type of person who's so into truth that I yeah. suspect he would have decided to teach somewhere else other than Athens rather than compromise his view on something. I, I just tend to think that everything he's saying, right or wrong, he was do, he was doing his best to be as sincere as he possibly could. Yeah. In fact, maybe my, my, my use of pragmatism is just slightly off target because maybe it's more about being real, about being authentic yeah. with oneself, one's psychology and with the world and so forth. And I, and I feel that authenticism, this genuineness from Epicureanism that I love. I think you certainly see that in Lucretius and in the way he tries to, as firmly as he can, be faithful to Epicurus and expresses those in several different ways. That He's trying to emulate Epicurus in a sense, but he's not trying to copy him because it's like a, a cult versus a stallion or something. He's uh, seeing the realities is that he's going to do the best he can, and, and that's what he's, that's the best he can so maybe I should we should flip over to the next two. The next paragraph I cited was this about the fate of greatness and wishing to be kind of a similar thing about grant than our great men fortunate. Are they happy? And then he goes back and forth with Leontia in particular, because that's where she responds and says that in terms of reaching capacity, there's those who try to achieve greatness who have the capacity for, to do to achieve it. And then there's those who probably do have the capacity to practice hard. I don't know if I picked up enough out of that section. Joshua, did you pick up anything in there in the discussion of greatness? Or is it, it I, I didn't gather that it's a total, it's not just a condemnation of, of all attempts to be, it seems to be a little. I almost, Joshua, if you go and jump in front of me, if you got something here, but I got a thought uh, on this. Let me go just ahead. throw in one thing. Okay. I, I don't know yeah. if you just, uh, I don't know if you just said this, Cassius, but there is that response to Epicurus where somebody, maybe Theon is speaking and he says, happy or not happy, who would refuse their faith? In other words, you know, who, who would not choose to be Homer, for example, even though you were unhappy? Maybe that maybe there are, there are lives that it's worth living, even if they don't yield happiness, just because of the stature of the life or the fame or the, I guess I don't know how I would put that, but that's one thing. That, well, that, that me, part of like it. Kind of happiness. To me, that seems like a kind of happiness. How did we skip by that first paragraph so quickly there? Is it not Epicurus talking here? The fate of greatness will always be enviable. Yes. Yeah. And I'm this pretty is, sure. he's saying, yeah, well-merited fame has in itself a pleasure so much above all pleasures that it may weigh in the balance against all the accumulated evils of mortality. Even one's death is outweighed by the fact that I live this incredible life. There can be such a sense of pleasure in the satisfaction of knowing I, what I did that it outweighs everything else. That is still true to pleasure, but it's very much not shooting down greatness and trying to make uh, have a distinct, great distinction and so forth. Like those things aren't necessarily evil. They seem to be on the opposite side. Very, very important. Very not not important because most people can't obviously ob obtain that kind of satisfaction. Perhaps but it reminds me about Epicurus saying that you know even when you get to the end of your life, you can feel really great about it as you're on your deathbed because you can look back and say, "Whoa, that was really cool. <laughs> That's really great. That's a good feeling." Instead of regret and oh shit, I just screwed everything up. I can't believe I'm here now. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> the opposite. I'm with you, Scott. But before I go into more detail. I think Joshua was going to say something. I was just going to throw that little quote in there, but I think he's he's explored it pretty well. Scott, the way I apply that part in my thinking is we've talked about before this issue of just abstractions and are abstractions necessarily bad? And of course, I think that's not true that just because they not don't have an eternal, infinite existence of their own, that doesn't mean that the, the things we come up with in our minds are not extremely important to us. And, and that would, I think, I think this is a a way of saying that is you can get extreme, at least I, I, in my observation, you can. And I think it's in a limited way. I've, I've seen some of that myself. You get a lot of pleasure out of doing things that other people appreciate. And the more people who appreciate it, the more benefit that you, you spread out to other people in, in whatever it is you're doing. That is a very, very pleasing feeling. I guess it's, you can equate it to fame and performing arts and so forth. But how you weigh these pleasures, I think, is it's a very personal thing. And in terms of being a great, like a big great soul, for example, you may mm -hmm. uh, you may end up giving up your life in younger years than you would otherwise. But the idea of achieving some military victory that has saved your people or something like mm -hmm. that, it may not extend your life at all. 
but it can be certainly extremely pleasing in the, in the process of, of doing it or if you realize that. You, so is it sure just just as talking about giving up your life for a friend? Yes. Yes. You could give it up for your country or something else or some idea that you believe in very much or something, you know, and that could be so rewarding and so overwhelming that that's the greatest pleasure for you to, to fulfill that. Kevin, go ahead. Did, did, did Francis Wright have some point here then in including, I don't know how to pronounce the name, because but like Cowan, who's described as um, an Aristippian or a Cyrenaic, right? Someone who believed only in immediate physical pleasures. I just cheated by doing a, a search in the Kindle edition, and, and the character doesn't show up anywhere else in the book. Right. He shows up in this one place. He's described mm -hmm. as being very concerned about his appearance and not wanting to get any of the cynic on him. Right. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. He's a pretty boy. <laughs> yeah. But the Cyrenaics were the they, they didn't write much, but their their school was all about immediate physical pleasure, um, living it only in the present with no real concern for the past or the future. And that just seems from everything you were saying now and describing these bits about greatness and the pleasures that come from achieving good things. A real contrast to the Cyrenaics, who they really yeah. did live that sort of debased caricature that most people have of Epicureans through the centuries. I think they're different. I don't know how much experience. Well, I mean, I haven't read a lot about them, but I thought that they were more similar to Stoics than that. The, the cynics and are, that the Cyrenaics were sort of immediate. The, from what yeah. I've read about them, they... They believe that the only thing you're certain of is your immediate experience. So there's no concern about a future self. Mm. All you have is pleasure in the moment and pain in the moment. So mm. pleasure in the moment is the thing to, to live for. It's almost hard to believe sometimes to me that they really believed it that rigorously. But yes, Scott, that's what I'm reading too. It's, it's hard it's, to believe they wrote anything down if they did believe it that rigorously. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you have to I'm wonder if it's not caricature. Irenaeus. Go ahead, Scott. I I'm getting confused about the entities here that you're talking about. I may be confusing two different things. Have you read much, Scott, about the Cyreniacs? That's who we're talking about now. Um, I thought that I had I had called them Cyreniacs, but I mean, um, oh, you may be right. Yeah, they, yeah, um, yeah they were. Uh, let's see, the 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 first of them, um, whose name I don't remember. Then there was a there was a there was a grandson that really kind of wrote things down later on, wasn't there? I yeah, I oh, Cyreniac, because you're saying Cyreniac, okay. Um, and yeah, they, um, they tried to sort of play down grandpa's approach, which was, which was represented the way you're talking about, which is just the only damn thing is I get my smoke right now. I get my drink right now and that's it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they started putting a little bit more complexity into it. And I think what little we have that might be written down and what we've learned about more is, is not quite that radical. I think that was one yeah. person maybe it was kind of like that. I think probably I've read somewhere that. In in the later years, the Cyrenaics sort of faded away. You know that they, they part of them mm -hmm. melded into the Epicurean school um, because I think, as you say, their their teachings over time began to more closely resemble Epicurean philosophy, or at least a superficial understanding of it. And so I think I think I've read somewhere that it didn't last very long. In other words, <laughs> hard to yeah. sustain that lifestyle after twenty five. So here's here's the other question, uh, and I guess this would almost be a mortal sin for Frances Wright if she did this, but as with all of these words, words like stoic and cynic and skeptic and epicurean, they have a philosophical meaning in the context of Greek or ancient Greece, I should say, or, or classical antiquity might be a broader way to put it. And then they have a sort of modern, watered-down, completely different meaning um, in most cases. And it's possible... It's possible that, in other words, that when she says Aristippian, as sort of as sort of the last word, you know, almost like a throwaway word at the end of the sentence, it's possible that she's merely using that as an adjective um, and, and not to say that he was actually an adherent of that school. But as I say, that that would almost be a mortal sin to do in, in a book on philosophy because it's hopelessly confusing. I, of course, use the word mortal sin facetiously. <laughs> <laughs> I may have misunderstood Kevin when he first introduced that, but the point I want to make sure I heard correctly, I think is one that I've not thought of before. So Kevin, you're saying that the the student of Epicurus who was introducing Gryphus here was, he was kind of a pretty boy or something. And so we're thinking he might've been associated with the Pyrenees. Yeah. He's, he's described yeah. as an Aristippian. So a mm -hmm. follower of Aristippus. Mm -hmm. but, um, well, just, just one little pedantic point. The person introducing 
Griffiths was Sofron, yeah. who okay. we who we met in chapter two. Good point. And Who's the... Lycaon, or, okay. or however you might pronounce that, was uh, was the other the other kid involved. <laughs> I'm thinking that what Kevin makes that it makes sense that that what we just were talking about in terms of the pleasures of greatness. I don't know if that's addressed specifically to that particular person or not. I, is that stated in the text here, or did you? He doesn't come up again. He's described. Oh, okay. He, he makes sure he keeps a person between him and the cynic. Mm. So probably not to get any, you know, dust on him or some such. Mm-hmm. And then he doesn't come up again and he doesn't contribute. It's weird to have him walk in with the cynic. <laughs> Got to be a reason for that he yeah. did that. Yeah. So I think you, you're potentially on to something. I wonder if we can explain that as well through the rubric of our uh, compare and contrast reading of the text. Because in chapter one, she mentions the academy when he first meets Theon, and he said, "From the groves of from the groves of the academy," and he said, "No, from the Stoic." And uh, he said, "I did not think that Zeno could send forth such a dreamer." So we've got the academy, we've got the Stoics, we've got now a cynic, we've got an Aristippian. They're going to later get a uh, Pythagorean. Is, is she just trying to get the full set here, or what's going on? I have a feeling to some extent she is. <laughs> yeah, and so therefore, this has definitely opened up a different perspective to me because I have been focusing on this as entirely devoted to the cynics. But I think, based on what Kevin suggested, that a lot of this uh, description is also targeted at Kareem. Almost as if they present the two extremes to be. Yes, favorite, yes, yeah, yes. And that indeed, that's exactly what Epicurus says in this other chapter, is that we need to keep equally clear of the one as of the other. And then Lycaon heard that, and he immediately stormed off and was never heard from again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, just so that I check the boxes here, let's check this last box of this discussion about, it's basically ambition itself that ambition is the spur and the necessary spur of a great mind to a great action. But then basically when acting upon a weak mind, pales it to absurdity or sours it with discontent. Mm-hmm. So since I don't have any acquaintance with great mind in this, you guys <laughs> tell me what. Well, when, when I read this, it was like, I guess almost like looking in the mirror, as they say, <laughs> um, because I have a brother who is very confident and is very ambitious. And in spite of the fact that we were raised in the same household and went to the same schools, you know, all of that, basically the same foundation, um, he has ambition and uh, is not shy about it. And I really don't. Um, <laughs> and, and and here at uh, roughly the age of 35, I mean, he's doing very, very well for himself. And I have no reason to doubt he won't continue. Um, to do very well for himself. So, well, Joshua, I, I suspect we can look for the clue right here. It says, "Though jewels be hid in a sack of oats, they'll never be found unless the oats be shaken." So that's what we're here to do: is to shake some oats. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's oats. your your role here in in the Epicurean discussions we have: is to shake those oats and find the jewels that are hidden within. That's an interesting turn mm-hmm. of phrase there. Well, are, isn't am I am I lost here? But I thought we were talking about kind of the same thing we were talking about with you know the, the greatness and seeking distinction and so forth here, right? I, I, so, I think so. Yeah, and so obviously then uh, the case of the jewels being hidden uh, is where you don't have the ambition part of it there, you know, and you have to have all the pieces together to have this great human being come together and, and live. And fortune has to provide certain things and so forth. In this case, though, it's talking about the capability. Some of us have gems inside of us. And, and if you don't have gems, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're missing one third of the picture there either. Like me, I might have great ambition for being a great person, but I just really don't have the stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to end up being unhappy with my life because I've only got two thirds of what I need to get, you know, to be great. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I think so. That sits with the part that comes later where he talks about how hard it is to tell when you really don't have the ability and how none of us really want to come around to recognizing I might not be great. <laughs> right? Talent flatters. What is it? The phrase talent flatters our vanity and the opposite does not. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we tend to think that we're really super, but when you get really, really honest, like Epicurus, perhaps, mm-hmm. you begin to say, you know, hey, I've got some good stuff going on. 
but I'm not great. <laughs> you know, one analogy that might be worth making here would be that again, for what Joshua mentioned earlier about whether epic philosophy is ascetic or not, it generally seems to me that he's attempting to match the reality. He's, he's not telling you to suppress all desire or ambition. He's suggesting to you ambition can be a good thing or can be something that leads to good things, but it's got to have the right circumstances to flourish or else it will impel you to absurdity or sour you with discontent. Yeah, because if you really think you're supposed to be great and it's not working out for you, you're going to get pissed off and then you're going to try to you know, really make it look, I didn't really want to be that way anyway. Or something. <laughs> or, or even, I guess, maybe even less than the issue of greatness. I, you could probably mm -hmm. just apply this to the whole issue of desire or, or ambition of any kind to, to do any better. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of tuning your ambition and your desire to your circumstances. If your circumstances uh -huh. are, are, are favorable to the success of the endeavor, then everything will work out fine. If they're not unfavorable for some reason, then you better be careful. Because and better even not do it. So it's just a, it's a matter of looking to whether your circumstances are are there are favorable or not, which is a very again uh, fact specific contextual type thing. It's not a blanket endorsement of ambition, nor is it a blanket denunciation of ambition. Yeah, and that seems like a bunch of circumstances or things in the world around you and your own makeup, but things mm -hmm. beyond your control. Yeah. Again, a, a realistic point of view yeah. and not just a, a flat endorsement or a flat denunciation. And sort of built in there that we, you were talking about truth earlier, right? Any element of self-deception is going to lead you to absurdity or sours mm -hmm. you with discontent. If you, you don't recognize the hard truth, you're going to be more miserable. Yep. And boy, that does seem to apply almost. That's one of those principles of wide application, as, as Torquato would yeah. say. It's, it, it's yeah. going to apply this, everywhere. This is leading in a depressing line. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. Now, now, why would you say it's depressing? I mean, you, know, you could say it's it's inspiring because if you have not if you have not attempted to do those things that you have the capacity to do, then you need to be spurred to additional action, Joshua. Right, Joshua? I, I guess. You know, there's <laughs> there's one more story um, from Diogenes that I didn't that I didn't relate, but almost it's the most important of all. Um, I'm starting to think there are a number of stories actually where he meets Alexander the Great in person. Have you encountered any of these, anybody? I've yeah. heard of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Alexander the Great, you know, has heard things about Diogenes. He's sort of a legendary figure. And so he stops by the tub <laughs> and uh, wants to talk to him. And Alexander the Great shows up. The one that I remember best is uh, Alexander the Great shows up and says, you know, I'm I'm Alexander the Great. Is there anything you would ask? Of and Diogenes said, yes, you're standing in my light. Can you please move a little bit? <laughs> and after a number of interactions like that, Alexander walks away from this encounter and he says to himself, if I could not be Alexander, I would wish to be Diogenes. In other words, if yeah. I, if, <laughs> if, if I couldn't satisfy my ambition and, and conquer one world and then, you know, complain that there was not another world yet to conquer, I would want to be the kind of guy who would withdraw from the world and live in a tub. Um, because no, nothing in between would satisfy me. I now, see, it's, that's it's, the issue. Is is those are really the two extremes? It seems like. And not <laughs> well, that you're I'm, Alexander. If you're yeah. Alexander the Great, those might be the yeah, two extremes. Yeah. All or nothing. But that might be why uh, why she brought Griffiths into this. I, I, of course, don't know. But it certainly relates to this issue of uh, cynicism uh, versus ambition. You know, use the word all or the phrase all or nothing right there. It seems that that's something that I thought about a lot over the years. It's just that how I or, or certain people, it seems like when you can't have everything you want, seems like you're rebound and you just turn turn to depression and you just go for nothing. It's like it's like if you can't have everything, then I'm just going to take nothing. And that certainly does not seem to be very logical or Epicurean approach to me at this point in my life. Anyway. But very common. You know, yes. you get a new game, you sit around with the family to play this game and you just really do lousy and everybody's making you look like a fool. And you're like, hey, this is a stupid game. I don't like this. <laughs> anyway. It's not, you know, it's a dumb game. <laughs> I think I the classic childhood parlance here is well then i'll just take my ball and go home <laughs> yeah <that's laughs> right. 
Well, let's see. We're actually doing a good job. I guess we're sort of not, not asking to close or for closing comments or anything, but have we missed anything that anybody wants to bring out from the chapter that we just haven't talked about at all? I don't know that we missed it, but I really love this portrait of the cynic, right? That mm-hmm. was just straight up everything the cynics preached about aggressive free speech. Yeah, you're right. We did not attempt to go into that banter that they had back and forth, but it's pretty witty, I think. Oh, it's, uh, witty. About, oh my God, yes. it's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. the criticizing Epicurus for standing on ceremony as a cultural artifact that creates anxiety is just dead on what the cynics were about, and then yelling at him for doing it because they could, and mm-hmm. then storming off because he was done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. That that cynic conception of what it means to be a free person, <laughs> just yeah. I, I'm glad that they didn't have the internet then. There would have been too many trolls. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I just am continuously amazed at the depth of what's been constructed here in this dialogue with Francis Wright. And I, I think to myself, I mean, okay. So now I've one of the few philosophy professors I've ever met in my life. If you, if you spent the next 60 years of your life teaching philosophy and reading dodging Lurches, maybe this is an issue of the genius that we're talking about. It seems to me, no matter how much effort I put into uh, studying the details, of, to put together something like this was just a really strong intellect yeah. for somebody who's as young as you. This and is, this is an inspiring age. mind. Yeah, um, this is the person who should have the ambition to greatness. <laughs> yes, I, I, I and I guess she did, and probably that you could use her whole life as an example of somebody who is properly mm-hmm. following her desire to not necessarily be great, but but to just achieve ambitious things. My gosh, her whole story of America and palling with these famous people and setting up her own commune, sort of, and trying to free slaves and so forth. My gosh, she, she was. Mm-hmm. Certainly, an example of somebody who was had some favorable circumstances and seeds of ambition. And I think the uh, character of Sofran pro- progressively gets uh, more absurd as we go along. But beyond <laughs> right, that, <laughs> he was the one from chapter two where he, you know he had that over that really awkward greeting of Theon when he first showed up, and then now here he's he's saying, "Well, I want to be a philosopher and I want to supersede my master and." But he does kind of, in the end, pull it together. He says, "'Tis but a dangerous inmate, that being, I guess, ambition, as minds go, and I, for one, had better have none of it, for I doubt I am not born to be an Epicurus, and I am certain I have no inclination to be a Grippus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's the last substantive comment of the chapter. And then they all go off to the bath. <laughs> yes. Yes. I just opened up a window and I see that Calasini has made a comment about how Epicureanism points to going after the natural and the necessary for life, for health, and for happiness. So, yeah, not just the minimum. But you also don't need to be an Alexander the Great to uh, Correct. Yes. achieve yes. that as well. Yeah. But boy, that'd be one way to summarize the chapter. Is, is, it's, it's wrong to be, from this point of view, to be <laughs> either a cynic or a, an Alexander. Yeah. Or not necessarily wrong to be an Alexander the Great, but there's not too many Alexander the Greats that come rolling down the pike in favorable circumstances to conquer the known world. I have a hard Um, time thinking Epicurus, if this is the right picture, would have thought well of the cynic. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I don't know that any of the schools really developed after Epicurus, other than the Stoics were kind of developing around the same time. But everything else, did anything develop after? The Stoicism was really after him, wasn't it? I mean, essentially. They claim roots to Socrates and then every, I mean, I don't know when Zeno would have been around the same time, right? Well, that's the, that's the issue of this book. I used to question whether this book was wrong in having the potential for an, a meeting between Epicurus and Zeno, but I think I've read, and Kevin, you'd be the only, the best expert. I, I believe so, but not based on anything other, based on, not based on any knowledge, right? I don't know that I've ever really thought about it. I'm right. pretty sure we have recording. I'm pretty sure we have dates on that. I think if we look it up, though, there's a very small overlap between Epicurus life okay. and Zeon, and that they really would not have met as adults and, and confronted one another philosophically. Uh, yeah, I was thinking something like maybe a 12 year overlap, but. So that may be a, a yeah, stretch. Yeah. Yeah. So probably yeah. was a crack, but still well enough known to be at least the later one. I wonder if the only school, the new Hellenistic school Epicurus wouldn't be aware of is to be the academic skeptics. Do you have a name you associate with the academic skeptics, Kevin? I don't. Cicero, usually. 
right? He's okay. Well, but there were there are dozens before that, but they don't turn up that I know of until well after Plato. Several generations they become the new academy. They take on skepticism and reject Platonism. The new academy yeah. is what I've heard of before, and it seems like there's somebody that Cicero cites whose name starts with a P, maybe or Panateus or something like that. That I've seen Cicero in his the book on uh, duty. Uh, what is it? They'll think East or yeah. whatever. It seems yeah. like that he cites somebody that I've... he cites an I can't remember the name either. An Athenian politician who comes to Rome and on consecutive days gives a beautiful speech in favor of one course of action and the next day against it, and then says, <laughs> "Either no good arguments for anything." <laughs> I was just looking quickly to see if there's anything we needed to comment on. Joshua, did you look ahead to next week what the topic is? It's an argument with the Cleanthes and uh, the Stoic about... Uh, right. Uh, so this is the Stoic, chapter... Stoicism. This is the chapter right before the chapter where Epicurus actually shows up okay, okay. at the uh, portico, I think. Yeah, in fact, I don't think that Epicurus really factors too much in the next chapter, in chapter five. It's really mostly a discussion with these and, and Theon. And then you you start to get a sense of how things operate at the uh, at the portico because uh, Cleanthes uh, absolutely gets himself into a fit and collapses okay, <laughs> because okay. because his friend has uh, been seen leaving the garden of Epicurus. Okay, well there'll definitely be some analogies and parallels and things that can draw out next week as well, but. But I don't know that it's super heavy on philosophical content. So, Scott, you, you'll, you'll be able to open up anything you'd like to again on on the greatest good or anything else you'd like to add to it next week. All right. Well, I'm, I'm aware that especially you guys on the West Coast or something, it could be dinner time and things like that. So we've been going an hour. We probably ought to stop unless anybody has something else to add. No, I think great job, okay. everybody. Yeah. It's been a good it's session been tonight. Fun. Yes. Thanks a lot. So we'll do it again next week. All right. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.